Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, a lot's been going on in my life. Uh, you see all these gray hairs, but yet I have a pregnant girlfriend. Um, I've been in court at many trials. So I haven't had the time that I'd like to really go through some recent matches. So it took me a while to actually sit down and watch Kevin Mitchell's match against Daniel Estrada. This is an important event, right? If you're a gambler, let's set the table. Understand that right now, there is a huge opening at 135 and 140. Right? Understand your Keith Gamboa lost to Terrence Crawford. Understand that Mikey Garcia, right? These are giants at 135. Mikey Garcia has been out the ring for a very long period of time. He's having a legal dispute with his promoter. Right? Understand at 140. Lamont Peterson and Danny Garcia are both having problems making weight at 140. It's so bad that the men asked for permission to fight each other at a weight above 140 pounds. Right? So what you have really is a situation where there's going to be a changing of the guard. In other words, some guys are simply going to grow out of their divisions. Terrence Crawford, from what I've heard, doesn't want to fight at 135. Right? Crawford himself walks around at 150. He might jump to 147 where there's a lot of action. So what you have is fertile ground for a fighter who knows what he's doing. To literally grab a hold of possibly 135 or 140, right? Lightweight or junior welter. Now you have guys losing weight to fit into those categories. Adrian Broner walks around a lot heavier than 140, right? Broner seems to realize that going down to 140 could be a coup for him. Let me say this, and I don't say it lightly. I understand the Kevin Mitchell Daniel Estrada fight was at 135 pounds. But let me just say, Kevin Mitchell, I'd take him over Adrian Broner today at 140 pounds. Right? Let's talk about why. Let's talk about this fight. Now understand, the guy he's fighting, Daniel Estrada, is trained by Nacho Beristain, the same trainer who trains Johnny Gonzalez and Juan Manuel Marquez. Right, so you have a superstar trainer in the corner. You have a guy, Estrada, who has a nice jab, who has volume. You figured he'd come in and he'd be battering Kevin Mitchell with the jab, at least setting up the rest of his game off the jab, right? Now, Mitchell, his biggest moments, unfortunately, he's come up short, right? Michael Cassidis was on his front foot against Kevin Mitchell. I had a pre-fight video up here on YouTube. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Right? Cassidus is on his front foot and walks down Kevin Mitchell. Ricky Burns is an even more interesting fight because these guys used to spar. Right? Ricky Burns comes in, Burns not known to be a big hitter, and starts throwing high punches on Kevin Mitchell, particularly high right hands on Kevin Mitchell, and actually stops him. Now let me say this, I don't think Ricky Burns can beat this version of Kevin Mitchell. In fact, 
I believe this is the best Kevin Mitchell I've ever seen. Right? Mitchell, to me, here, for this kind of fight, looks like he's a complete fighter. Let's talk about how he does it. Estrada comes in. He's looking for Mitchell. He wants to land a jab. Right? Now, Kevin Mitchell isn't in the pocket to get hit with the jab. What Mitchell does is he is too far away to get hit with the jab. Right? Mitchell also doesn't raise a hand to block the jab. Doesn't use his hands for defense. What Mitchell does is he maintains distance and then as Estrada throws a jab, Mitchell uses head movement. Mitchell uses upper body movement. Now it's a bit astonishing because understand Kevin Mitchell is actually the puncher in the fight. These guys are playing chess. Right? Mitchell has an explosive left hand. It's truly explosive. Right? He can throw it up top or he can throw it to the body. But as this fight opens, you don't realize Mitchell's the puncher in this fight. Because Mitchell is there on his back foot at times, dodging punches with his upper body and head movement. If you have a copy of this fight, I want you to just focus on Mitchell's head movement. It's breathtaking. Right? Mitchell's just in there dodging punches. Now, Mitchell, because he's too far away, right, he's relying on spacing here. Because he's too far away to get hit with the jab, right, Mitchell's able to carry his left hand low. Now, for the skeptics, I'll concede. Estrada's a right-handed fighter. The dynamic would be a bit different if Estrada is a southpaw then he'd be throwing a right jab right and that of course wouldn't give Mitchell the leeway to drop his left like he's doing here right those are the kind of things you think about as you look at fights but here he's in against an orthodox fighter so Mitchell is able to have his left low and what makes this interesting is the fact that Mitchell, right, who occasionally throws a jab, he has a decent jab. But keep in mind, you don't want a guy with this level of left hand. It's a showstopper left hand. You don't want a guy with this level of left hand tying up that left hand with jabs, right? You want him to be able to throw his left, which is his lead hand, because he's operating out of an orthodox stance, with power. And understand, Mitchell now has a game that just enables him to do a little drop step and to throw the left with power at different angles. So when this fight really gets going, Mitchell's not jabbing his way in. He's outside, too outside, right? Moving his head too much to get hit with Estrada's lead jab. And then he's showing what I call ring coverage. He can just take a step, drop a shoulder. He's throwing hellacious left uppercuts, right, from way out. He's throwing hellacious left uppercuts. He's throwing hellacious left hooks from way out against a taller guy. And he's accurate with it. Right? He's accurate with it. In other words, he, to me, 
is kind of like the current version of Miguel Cotto. Right? Same type thing. Cotto has a big left hand. It's up front. Even though Cotto is a big puncher, Cotto doesn't try to overwhelm you with a front foot game. Rather, he's moving around the ring, fighting small, making it hard for you to find him. Then he comes in and he flashes the left, right? But does it in such a way where you can't tie him up, right? I would encourage people to look at this Mitchell fight and look at the lack of clinching, right? Understand Mitchell is dodging Estrada's punches. Then he's coming in with big left hands, huge left hands. When they start landing flush, as this fight progresses, Mitchell's body shakes when he's hit with these left hands. But Mitchell does it in such a way where Estrada can't take a step forward and grab him, tie him up right? Let me say this. For those of you watching the heavyweight division, for those of you preparing yourself for Brian Jennings against Vladimir Klitschko, right? This is the way one would fight Vladimir Klitschko, right? This is the way Carlos Takam for Tony Thompson. In other words, Kevin Mitchell is there inflicting big punishment. He knocks down Estrada in the third round. Right? He's inflicting big punishment. But he's not there to be tied up. He's only on his front foot, really, when Estrada is retreating or on counters. He's not wasting a lot of time trying to jab his way in. Rather, he's leading, he's coming in, he's countering with power shots. He's not trying to throw combinations. He's trying to set up a huge left hand. Right? But he's patient with it. Right? He's measured. The spacing is such that against a jabber like Estrada, Mitchell's too outside and he's fighting too small, having a vertical game, right? Other times he comes a little closer, he knows the spacing to the point where when Estrada throws a jab, he just leans back. Right, Mitchell at 30, his knowledge of spacing, especially in a fight like this, that's not in fourth gear, like the Casitas fight, where Casitas is stalking him and there's constant action. Rather, this fight's in third gear. Right, it's a measured chess match where Estrada is trying to set up a jab, Mitchell won't allow him to. And as Estrada comes forward, Mitchell plans entry points and is throwing power shots to come in. Right? This kind of fight suits Kevin Mitchell to a T. He's dangerous. He's better than he's ever been. Right? The only guys I would, if I were Mitchell, be concerned about at 135 or 140. And I'm going to exclude Lamont Peterson. I'm going to exclude Danny Garcia because I think those guys have moved on a bit. Right? I think those guys are marketing themselves at 140ers, right? But they're really 147s. Right? The only guys at 135 and 140 who if I were advising Kevin Mitchell, I would say, "Whoa, player, don't fight these guys right now. Would be Miguel Vasquez, 
Because understand, Vasquez himself has great ring coverage, has a great jab, and can come find you in the pocket. In other words, he's more mobile than Daniel Estrada. Right? Miguel Vasquez, Yorkies Gamboa. I know Gamboa looked bad against Terrence Crawford. Right? But understand Gamboa is a guy who moves well, who himself can come in with leverage and big power shots. Right? And of course Terrence Crawford. Because Crawford, like heavyweight Tyson Fury, can be long with both a left jab and and a right jab. In other words, Crawford can himself stay out of the pocket and find you. Right? Other than those three guys, the sky's the limit for Kevin Mitchell. Right? I think a Mitchell Adrian Broner fight, and let's be real here, Broner is big for 140. Right? Broner himself might not be able to make 140 over time. Right? Broner is exactly the kind of guy who I believe Mitchell could feast on. Because Broner doesn't move that well. In his mid-twenties, he's already lost some of his movement. So Mitchell then would be able to set up the third gear spacing game that he sets up beautifully here with Daniel Estrada. What's interesting with Mitchell, too, is Mitchell has a really good compact right hand. This is something that Miguel Cotto doesn't have. Right? Mitchell has a very good compact right hand. Very good compact right hand. It's just that his left is A+. Plus, right? That we really don't talk about his right. So there are moments here where Estrada figures out how to dodge Mitchell's left hand, only to get hit with a very straight, very short right hand. Right? Let me say this, too. You know, as fighters get older, they learn a lot about themselves. There are moments in this fight, second round, for example, where Kevin Mitchell allows himself to have his back up against the ropes. Right? Where Estrada gets rid of the pocket and actually gets Estrada up on the ropes. Excuse me, gets Mitchell up on the ropes. And I want you to just look at Mitchell's face. He's calm. Right? The ropes are just another part of his game. He's on the ropes. He's not panicked. He's calm. Right? He looks at Estrada he sees what Estrada is throwing. He's able to block Estrada's punches, right? There are times where Estrada tries to let go with a left hand, and Mitchell, very calm, right, just raises the right hand to block it, right? In other words, this guy is at the stage of his career where the action slowed down for him, where he's not panicked right this was an eye-opener for me I thought Estrada would do a lot better now it worked out okay for me because my hedge was Mitchell by stoppage and Mitchell got the stoppage but that was really a hedge position I was expecting Estrada to do a lot better and he got neutralized Mitchell literally took away his jab and because Mitchell has reached a point where he can just leap in, right? Leap in with left hands, right? Um, he's hard to block because it's hard to stop a pattern that consists of one punch, right? Let me say this too. And Adrian Broner likes to have a raised shoulder, right? He likes to tuck his head on his left shoulder. Right, making it hard to hit him from this angle, right, from the outside in. The problem with that is Mitchell, like Cotto now, can drop a shoulder and can throw an uppercut that would land right here. Also, Mitchell himself, 
very accurate, can throw that left to the body underneath an elbow. Right? So to me, any fighter at 135 to 140, and this includes Mikey Garcia, any guy at 135 to 140 who stays in the pocket and is relying on a jab to create distance is at risk against Kevin Mitchell. I thought it was a great performance. I thought it was an A-plus performance. I thought it was Mitchell's best performance. Boxing's a weird sport. Right, I think uh, Ricky Burns and Michael Cassidis both have a lot of wear on the tire now. If Kevin Mitchell signed up today to avenge his loss to Ricky Burns, I'd take Mitchell in that fight. I think he does it. Right? The Cassidis who beat him years ago, right, I don't think no longer exists. It would be fascinating to see if that Cassidis could beat this Mitchell, right? As it is, if Mitchell were to fight Cassidus today, I think Cassidus has way too much wear on the tire to be competitive, right? I think Kevin Mitchell is a survivor. I think he deserves your attention at both 135 and 140. Understand, he's the mandatory right now at 135. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.